Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome back to UCD this evening, albeit not in person, to this reimagined virtual celebration of your diamond and golden jubilees. We only wish that we could be celebrating this milestone reunion with you in O'Reilly Hall, sharing fond memories, stories and laughter with old friends and classmates. I'm extremely proud that the O'Reilly Hall is currently in use as one of the HSE's vaccination centres in Dublin and heartened to witness the steady stream of people, which is a testament to the success of the vaccine rollout program here in Ireland. We've all felt the burden of the past 18 months. The pandemic has disrupted our normal lives and we have seen so many of our plans upended and our social lives curtailed. Yet the strength of the human spirit prevails and this evening's event is a reminder of how we have found new ways to connect and support one another despite the challenges. I know that this is not the reunion you expected or hoped for, but I applaud your goodwill in adapting to the circumstances and thank you most sincerely for your past understanding. Over the past year, while the campus was quiet in terms of the number of people here, we dropped from a daily population of over 17,000 to around 3,000. We've continued to teach and to research, and our students have shown tremendous resilience and flexibility in adapting to new ways of living and learning. We continue to do all we can to support them and to ensure their safety and well-being as we shortly begin a new academic year. 
I'm immensely proud of the UCD community of students, faculty and researchers who have shown great courage and determination at the forefront of Ireland's response to the pandemic. From fundraising and volunteering to designing and manufacturing critical medical equipment and developing clinical treatments for COVID-19. So many of our alumni are doing inspirational work, not only on the front line of healthcare, clinical research and vaccine development, but across the many diverse strands of the national and global response. As a research intensive university, we were in a strong position to respond rapidly from the outset across a broad spectrum of academic disciplines. The future is bright. Here on the Belfield campus, there is a palpable sense of energy and excitement as we embark on a new academic year with a safe return to campus life and the prospect of spontaneous interactions and social gatherings. Thank you to you, our valued alumni of 1961 and 1971, for your engagement with UCD over the years, your commitment and support for our students. You're a vital source of strength in so many ways, from volunteering your time and skills to generously supporting the UCD COVID-19 Emergency Fund. I want you to know how much I value your loyalty and generosity of spirit. Knowing that we can rely on your steadfast commitment and support gives us the strength to persevere through these challenging times. Tonight, we will celebrate our global community our connections and our experiences. I hope you enjoy the event and I look forward to welcoming you back to campus very soon. Good evening and welcome to this online event to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the graduation of the UCD class of 1971 and the 60th anniversary for the class of 1961. As you'll know, we had hoped to gather in the O'Reilly Hall here on the UCD campus, but because of COVID-19 restrictions, we've decided for the second year in a row to record the content of what would have been happening on stage. And we're coming to you from the UCD University Club, where we have brought together some of the graduates from those years. Two who couldn't attend in person will be joining us online towards the end. Now, I'm going to introduce all of the speakers together so as not to interrupt the flow of the conversation later. So we'll start with our two guests who graduated in 1961. Dr. Tony Scott is a physics graduate and he began to research which led to his MSc and his PhD and was then appointed to the staff of the physics department. He later served as Dean of the Faculty of Science and on the governing body and he also served as Director of Public Affairs for the University. A spin-off from his research led to the development of the domestic smoke alarm. Along with his late colleague, Father Tom Burke, they founded the annual Young Scientist Exhibition following a research trip to New Mexico where they came across a similar event. The 2021 exhibition was the 57th one. Tony has served on the boards of a number of national cultural institutions and he's also received a number of awards and honorary degrees. And were I to list them, we'd be here till tomorrow. <laughs> Charles Lysett entered UCD from Gonzaga and got a first in economics, politics and jurisprudence. Concurrently, he read for the bar. He was active in the History Society and the LNH, of which he was gold medalist and a defeated auditorial candidate. He went on to Christ College Cambridge as a graduate student and he defeated Vince Cable to become president of the Cambridge Union. After three years lecturing in law at London University and practicing at the bar, Charles returned to Ireland in 1970. He lectured at King's Inns and worked successively as a lawyer in the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Law Reform Commission. His biography of Brendan Bracken was published in 1979. Charles has edited a collection of Irish obituaries from the Times to whose columns he himself has been a regular contributor. Entitled Great Irish Lives, it includes obituaries of several college figures, including his old professor, George O'Brien. Mm -hmm. And our guest to represent those who graduated in 1971 is Eana Nilalna. She's an Irish biologist, environmental consultant, radio and television presenter, author and educator. 
She's one of the best known public figures in Ireland in the area of nature and the environment and has appeared on Ireland's influential 100 list. Her engaging broadcasting and writing style has helped expand so many Irish people's knowledge of the natural world. She's currently president of the Tree Council of Ireland. She has also served as president of Anthashke and has written, edited or co-authored a number of books. Her most recent book, Our Wild World, was published by O'Brien Press in April 2021. Her latest achievement, she tells us, is attaining grade one in the concert flute with the Royal Irish Academy of Music, having taken it up just last November. <laughs> Anna graduated from UCD in 1971 with a BSc in Botany and Microbiology and completed her postgraduate studies in Plant Ecology. She also holds a higher diploma in Education. What a bunch of high achievers I have before me. Dr. Tony Scott, let me start with you. Did you kind of drift into UCD? Was, was that the normal course that was intended for you? Or was there any, were there alternatives? Or how did you end up coming here? Well, I was stimulated, I suppose, in, in terms of doing science by my science teacher uh, in Turner College where I was. And in fact, my science teacher was Father Tom Burke, who you mentioned in the introduction, ah. who later joined me as a colleague in the, on the staff. So he gave me an interest in science and I sort of gravitated towards UCD for reasons that I'm, I'm not aware of now, but I did. And of course, I'm very happy that I did. Yeah. So it was a, in October of 1957, it would have been, I rolled up with 70 pounds in my hand and went up the front steps of Earlsford Terrace into the Great Hall or the main hall. And there were desks there with people, ladies sitting beside them, and they had science and law and medicine, what have you. And so I joined the queue for science, which wasn't too big. There are various stories about people who didn't know what they wanted to do, and they just joined the, 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 the queue with the smallest number. And they ended up doing whatever it was <laughs> at the smallest number. It, it was quite different in those days because in those days, the CAO, of course, wasn't a figment of anybody's imagination. All you required was the matriculation. And for many of us, we actually didn't do the matric. Some did. You could buy your matric off the leaving cert. But I, I don't remember how I bought it. Mm -hmm. I must have. But anyway, I ended up in science. So it, it was a, a curious introduction into science. And why, was it, why was it curious? Well, curious in the sense that there was, we didn't have any, any documentation telling you what you should be doing and where you should be. You just kind of drifted in in those days and you're meant to follow your nose. So you were told that lectures would begin the following day, so you had to pick four subjects. And I, I, as far as I remember, I picked physics, chemistry, maths, and maths physics. And the interesting thing was, the way they worked it out was physics and maths, and maths physics indeed, was up in Earthford Terrace whereas chemistry was down in Merrion Street. Oh. And the way that the lectures were run was you, you started off, say, 9 o'clock in Earlsford Terrace, then 10 o'clock Merrion Street, back to Earlsford Terrace, back to that. That's a very quick turnaround. How yeah. did you get up and down? Well, you had a bicycle. Ah. <laughs> And of course, the, the great thing about the bicycles was you, you threw your bicycle against the wall in Earlsford Terrace, and when you came out uh, at 5 to 10 to get down to Merrion Street for, for 10 or 5 past 10, as it was, uh, you, if your bicycle wasn't there, you just picked another bicycle and you cycled down to Merrion Street. And when you got to Merrion Street, of course, your bicycle would have been there. Somebody else had swapped your bicycle. Great system. So it, it was a system of commuting up and down between it. And if you had time, of course, the great thing was there was a, a little shop at the bottom of uh, uh, College, um, Marian, College Green there, K, KB, KBC, yeah. where you could get cream cakes and coffee. And that was a, a real delight. But, but you had to have time. You had to have your timing right uh, to be able to do that. <laughs> right. And, but I still like cream slices, but you can't get them nowadays. <laughs> Probably we shouldn't be having them nowadays. Um, was the atmosphere very different between Merrion Street and Earlsford Terrace? Well, of course, the thing is, in Merrion Street, we had the engineers with us in Merrion Street, whereas up in Earlsford Terrace, we were surrounded by the cultural group of the arts and commerce students. Yeah. Merrion Street was slightly more um, 
uh, abrasive, we really put it that way, because you had the engineers. The other interesting thing is, and I, and I did discover a photograph, and I'll see, can I give it, they might be able to use it. The, the, the theatres were all, num they all had numbers behind the seats, right? And you had to attend, I think it was 75% of your lectures to be allowed to sit for your exam. So therefore, when you came in in the morning, you went, I remember my seat in chemistry was 108. Right. So I climbed up and I made sure that it was 108. And about 10 minutes after the lecture started, a technician would come in and he would write down the numbers he could see. They were the empty ones. And they were the empty ones. And if you missed three in a row, you got a letter sent to you by the professor uh, asking you to come in and explain why you hadn't attended for three days. Wow, sounds like school. It was a bit like school. But the interesting, they wrote to you, but they didn't write to your parents, which was interesting. Good. You were a grown-up by then. Well, they expected. treated you as kind of a, a grown-up. Um, so it was... I'm but, sure there were people who found ways of getting around. Oh, of course there were. You could put your arm up cover somebody's next door. But the, the, the other thing was, of course, you were assigned a number. And it couldn't be done nowadays. The nuns who were all in dress and their habits always sat in the front row. Yeah, right. And then in behind them were the lady students. And then behind them were the mob, the men. <laughs> they were always in the back of the, yeah. the theatre. And I, I have a photograph, which I have at home, and I bring it in sometime for you. You can see the nuns at the front. Really? With their ladies behind and then the yeah. people. Was it you who told me that you used to take photographs in yes, the lecture theatres? I took photographs in lecture theatres. You know, I have some of, uh, one of, one with the late Dr. Ivo Sullivan um, giving, just finishing off a lecture in chemistry. Yeah. And I have another one of, of um, I can't remember his name. He was lecturing in maths. You could see, read the maths. Yeah. Now, the thing I remember about him was interesting. We finished lectures at half past five or half past five today. And the following morning, you had the maths exam. And I remember when I went in and got that paper, it was stuff we did at five o'clock the previous day. Really? Well, of course, nowadays, students are spoiled because they get weeks off to, to revision and what have you, whatever. Not that we would, probably wouldn't have done revision anyway, but, mm. but that was... It, was a, it sounds very regimented and very fast-moving. It was fast really, moving. yeah. You, yeah. you didn't... Um, but were you, you sound like you enjoyed it, did oh, you? Oh, yes. Did oh. you join societies at all? Oh, yeah, well, of course, you joined the sign. You had to join the society, societies because... Um, the, the, there wasn't quite a freshers' week as such, but you were encouraged. Everybody would come around asking you for two and sixpence to join the, this society or that society. <laughs> yeah. So I joined the scientific society, which incidentally was the second oldest society after the LNH. Was it? I never joined the LNH because I was probably too shy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to the LNH in due course. <laughs> yes. So I joined the scientific society, and of course that was... Uh, we used to have meetings every second week and you went in and you had tea and buns and then you sat in and listened to a lecturer or something like that. Yeah. And did you do anything unrelated to science during your time at college? Uh, well, sport, obviously. Sport and I was involved extramural, if you like, from the college. I was involved in a dramatic society. Were you? I was, in, uh, I was the stage manager for a... Uh, a drama society past pupils at Turner College and we had some very famous actors Donald McCann was one of our cast and yeah. uh, David Kennedy later of Aer Lingus and Bank of Ireland was also a nurse yeah. and we used to put on plays uh, both in Dublin and in various places around the world so that was my activity and then the other thing I got involved with of course was involved with a, running a youth club in Renla for, for people who were less fortunate than us. So. Oh, I see. So you had a very, very busy life. Oh, well, it took, up my, it took my time up, yes. Nowadays, of course, you'd be going off to your part-time job in the evenings, uh, trying to make a few bob to yeah. sustain, if not your fees, your social life. Yeah, well, um, that didn't arise then, did no, it? No, it didn't. No, you, but you tried to work. You had to work during the summer, of course, uh, to earn some money. and. Uh, I, 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 was, uh, I got a job in Aer Lingus, and I remember my first summer I, I spent down in Shannon uh, loading passengers and trimming the aircraft and making sure the, the right amount of passengers were sitting in the right place and the load was, and the baggage was distributed so the aircraft remained balanced when it took off. 
So interesting times Yeah. added to my experience. Can I bring you back to something you said earlier when you described the, the, the nuns in the front, yes. the uh, women next and then the men. Were, were there many women doing science in those days? There were some, yes, there were, there were some. There was one nun I remember particularly, and I remember her name if I may mention it. I think she was from Trinidad, Sister Pereira was her name. She was a lovely little nun, but she was so bright, I mean. Uh, she, she got sort of up in the high 90s when the rest of us were groveling around wherever you want to put us. But I, I, I remember her in second year. When we went into second year, uh, we, had a, we had to do experiments, and she was in the class with me. And the experiment she was doing was uh, calibrating a, a Geiger counter to measure radiation. And you had to put on the wiring the high voltage in one terminal and the low voltage in, and then the earth on the other. And she switched them. And I remember Professor, Professor Porter, the late Professor Porter, came in because she put up her hand and said it, it wasn't working. So he came over and he put his hand on the outer part, which was, should have been at earth, and it was at 1,500 volts. And I remember him performing a, a lovely arc across the, the lab. And she was <laughs> terrified that she'd killed him. And of course, he picked himself up. He was a bit shaken. Wow. But she was, she was so bright. But she, she was way up there compared to the rest of us because I presume she worked. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for those recollections, Tony. We will have some more later if we have time okay. to come back to you. But it's a, a very interesting picture to paint. Now, Indeed. while you were not joining the LNH, Charles Lysett <laughs> was a leading light and was firmly into it. But let's start, Charles, like we did with Tony, to talk about what it was like when you first came in and what it felt like. Can you remember? It was Earth for Terrace, of course. Yes. Yes, uh, well, we were just Earth for Terrace. It was just friendly. There were, I suppose I'd have known my contemporaries at school were there. And I think from the day one was struck with what a friendly place it was. And that would be my mm. uh, enjoyment. And were you clear about what it was you were going to study? Yes, I think I'd worked that out. Yes, I was doing law and then I was going to do the economics mm. thing with George O'Brien. Yes, no, I was clear on that. He was a big figure, wasn't he? Yes, so he was coming to the end of his career. You know, he'd been a great figure. The students, he used to entertain students in a way other professors wouldn't. Uh, that, you know, he'd give dinners and ask students to them and that. Uh, really? He was much more caring of students generally. And he was a very charming man and he was a bachelor and he lived on his own. He lectured for many years in the college and he was so popular, he, he used to be elected to Shannon Aaron for the National University constituency. Right. Without, as he boasted, being an Irish language enthusiast or even a nationalist, <laughs> <laughs> he would be elected to that. Yeah. But he yeah. was a brilliant, he had been a brilliant lecturer, but he was really coming to the end of his days. One hadn't seen, you know, he was where he was coming to retirement mm. and he was well over the best days. So when you started then, would, did you feel com immediately comfortable? You had your school friends who were there and yes. you had chosen, I presume you discovered you had chosen wisely yes. in, your, in your subject matter. Were you comfortable, is that, I mean, when you decided to go join the LNH, what was the impetus to do that? It well, was kind of something you had to do, wasn't it, as a law student? No, not necessarily, not every, there was a law society, some preferred it, but I'd been, Gonzaga, the one thing Gonzaga was good as a school in those days was debating, so it was what you came and uh, the L and H uh, seemed to uh, drift into it. I don't think immediately, I think it was in my second term there. Yeah. I think I was more in the history society uh, earlier. I did history for one year, which was interesting. <coughs> the history school was different from everything else in that you had teaching as opposed to lecturing. Can you so explain? You, uh, you had tutorials. Oh. Whereas um, in most uh, uh, the faculties at that time, it was just lectures. Mm -hmm. And the history school also had people who weren't UCD graduates, which was uh, quite unusual. Right. And I had an eccentric professor called Desmond Williams was my tutor. I think he only turned up two or three times in the year, but still, <laughs> he was very good when he came. <laughs> <laughs> and then now there were other, another bizarre character, Dudley Edwards, oh, yeah. was, he, he arrived for his lectures at half past the hour. Really? And that, uh, but he'd be good for the remaining part, but 
but the history <laughs> school was well organised. These uh, so some very marvellous teacher Maureen Wall. She died youngish. Mm. She, she, I think, um, she was a really good teacher, as opposed to you know there were people who were good teachers as opposed to being very learned nestly in a subject. Though I suppose she was both, but she was very good. You you, you hear people say that it, the atmosphere of the time was quite authoritarian. Oh, yes. Were you conscious of that? Well, it's what I expected. You know, the, the, uh, yes, I mean, it was less authoritarian than being at school with the Jesuits. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, uh, yes, I mean, you expected uh, discipline and um, uh, they were looking over your, your behaviour. You know, you weren't uh, treated as an adult, as a free agent. That certainly just wasn't part of... Uh, being in any university. I mean, if you went to an English university, there were strict rules about how you behaved. Yeah. I'd say UCD was, um, I suppose, a little more keen on discipline. I think Michael Tierney would have been keen on discipline in the place. So, um, yeah. And, uh, so yeah. tell me then uh, about the LNH. You, you, what, what, what was the atmosphere like? Well, it time? was a kind of central. Uh, oh, it was marvellously entertaining, and certainly there was kind of mob there, and to manage to make your speech and not be shouted down was an achievement in itself. It was a, a very a great challenge, and it had great meetings and, and enthusiastic on the issues of the day, some wonderful meetings. But it was in rebellion, in a way. There was a lot of rebellion against the college authorities in those days. And uh, the L and H, there was opposition. A great uh, issue at the time was Belfield. All the great and good were against Belfield, really. The mm. people who were the cult figures were saying we should expand within the city. Yeah. We shouldn't leave Trinity and sole possession of the middle of Dublin. Right. So there was a, that was a very contentious thing. And of but course, Belfield was a, a, a pet project of Michael Tierney. Very it? much. And uh, it got the go ahead, of course, in 1960 from the government. But it was in the balance until then. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, that was very contentious. But Michael Tierney drove ahead. And if people who opposed to Belfield, he wouldn't... Um, allow them to be asked to college societies to give, to give talks. He had a list of people who were acceptable guests in the college. Really? Including the LNH, people who would come Oh, in? yes, all the yeah. societies, yes. No, you no. Had to, did you have to check your list of speakers oh, yes. within oh, yeah. oh, each oh, week? Yes, yes, there, there were various people, Noel Brown, Sheehy Skeffington, but generally anyone against Belfield. And then we're here in the alumni now. The alumni he, he wasn't so keen on because he... The convocation was opposed to the move to Belfield, and he banished the convocation from the college. He wouldn't allow them to meet at the college. But did they meet elsewhere? Uh, they met elsewhere. So there was quite a degree of contention. And the, if you like, he was doing the right thing in retrospect, but it wasn't seen so clearly uh, mm -hmm. at the time. And the L and H, of course, got up his nose in a big way because they passed resolutions against Belfield and everything. <laughs> and it all ended up in the society being expelled, suspended from the college. One of his things was, you see, you could be a member of a student society even if you were a graduate of one or two years. And people like that asserted their independence and made critical criticisms of the college. They had already left, so They'd their, left. So their academic could, careers weren't in any they danger. They couldn't be victimised. Yeah. And then uh, one of these was put up for the auditorship of the L and H, and the society was suspended from the college. Goodness. And uh, the election then was held um, uh, in a motor car outside the gate of college. Dermot Ryan of the car uh, led. Uh, he, he was an ex-auditor. And we had the debate outside the, <laughs> outside the gate of the college and uh, someone was elected. Then there was a great meeting in the Shelburne to which people came and uh, took poor Dr Tierney's name in vain. 
and so on, and so <laughs> rebellion. It gave quite prominent people, Tom O'Higgins, the future Chief Justice, Richie Ryan, yeah. Ulick O'Connor, of course, people like that. Yeah. Who, well, looking back at the, the, you wrote a lovely piece about the history of the LNH, yes. and um, there was there a wonderful so auditor uh, who was elected, I was defeated. But one thing I was, it was great I didn't get, because a man called Desmond Green, an engineer, oh. became auditor, and he really, he negotiated the return to the thing, and he's really he's uh, he was one of the wonderful, peacemakers. wonderful auditor of the yeah. LNH, should be remembered. You went up to Cambridge yeah. after you left yeah. here. How would you characterise the difference between life at Cambridge and life here? Well, it was very different, of course. I was living at home in Dublin, and that's a completely different experience uh, going in every day to having rooms of your own. Yeah. And of course, there was a style of life in Cambridge Commons and gowns in those days. And uh, of course, teaching uh, was, uh, uh, as an undergraduate, it was, uh, you know, you were teaching, not just lecturing. On, on that note, I might move on yeah. uh, 10 years. And if we have time, we might yeah. come back to a few more things at the end. Yeah. And to get back to Michael Tierney, we wouldn't be sitting here today in this extraordinary campus were it not for his uh, insistence on, on developing But he was a very project. nice man when you met him. Was he? You see, he had this bad image because of what he did. But mm. he was a lovely man to meet. Well, that's good to hear. You know, so it was... Right, if you don't mind, a leap of 10 years to 1961 and Eana Nilauna, you arrived here in, uh, you graduated, sorry, 1961, 1971. You arrived here in 1967 as that, an undergraduate. That's right, yeah. How did you end up coming to UCD? Well, no, it's a long story, but I will make a long story longer by telling you that in 1967, I was 16 doing my leaving cert. And at 16, you were too young to do teacher training. You were two years too young to do home economics. The only place that would take you while 16 was university because you had to be 17 by the end of the year and my birthday was at the end of October. So that was the first thing. And the second thing was then, how was I going to get to university? I had to get a scholarship because in those days, it was before the, the bringing in of free education and, and, and indeed all the points and everything else that was associated with it. So um, I came, it was county council scholarships, you see. Yeah. So you got scholarships for the county and each county had so many scholarships that were given by the county council. So allowed there were four. So I had it all worked out, who was the smartest in Louth, and I was the third smartest. Because <laughs> <laughs> you knew, because it was only Drogheda and Dundalk, I went to school in Dundalk to the nuns down yeah. there. And when I came in, when the Leave and Cert results came out, and I went in to find out how I did, they told me in the county council offices that um, I did very well for a woman. I came fifth. And I was furious, which meant I wasn't getting a scholarship. There were only four. Who were the other people that got them? Yeah. And they had been to school in Rockwell or other places where they weren't in the, in the Louth at all. They, had, they were from Louth, but they went yeah. to other places, which I thought was very mean. But anyway, I had done also a university exam where you could do a university exam and in your three best subjects. So I presented in, in um, geography and Irish and English. And there were five scholarships for each of those subjects. And I actually got a scholarship. I actually got a university scholarship in geography. Fantastic. And then I could go to college because I was getting 350 euros it was worth, which given that the fees were only 90, it was richness untold. Of course. But then what was I going to do when I went to college? Because I had done all in school. I had done art subjects. I had done Irish, English, Latin, French, history and geography because I was a girl in a girl's school and you didn't do science. And I hated them. You learned everything off by heart. I mean, I was great at it because I had a good memory. Yeah. But I wouldn't know a simile from a metaphor that trumped up and bit me if it wasn't one of the poems I'd learned at school. Yeah. So I decided I was going to do science. And in those days, you could start from the beginning. So I did physics, and I did chemistry, and I did maths, and then biology wasn't even a leave and search subject then. I did botany, so I had those four subjects. And you had year. never studied any of those subjects before? Well, we had intercert science, but I mean, yeah, that finished yeah. like a couple of years previous to that. No, yeah. I hadn't. So you had to go in and you were learning about atoms and molecules. And I think Tony Scott was demonstrating to us, and he wasn't lecturing to me in physics, but he was a demonstrator yeah. about the practicals because we did practicals with each one as well. So we had lectures in the morning and we had practicals in the afternoon. So I had three practical subjects. So two days a week, we had a physics practical, two 
two days a week we had a chemistry practical and two days a week including Saturday morning we had botany practical so we were kind of busy and we were in Belfield we were in the terrible Belfield that <laughs> Michael Tierney had got and it was a building site the only place that was out here was the science buildings and every, yeah. it was like a big school. There were 300 of us in first year. And it was like a big school. I mean, really and truly, it was because there was no, everything else was being dug. The lake was being dug. Everything was mucky and a, and a huge, huge site. We used to go for walks around it at lunchtime for exercise. Really? And it was a huge, huge site altogether. It's great to see, you know, how well it has developed in the 50 years since then. Wow, yeah. And we had all of these things in school. And it was great fun. I loved it. It was Did absolutely, you? oh, I loved it. It was great. I was up from Dublin. I was staying in Loretto Hall in Stephen's Green. We used to refer to it as Virginity Hall. <laughs> <laughs> we had to be in at night, at, and I half nine on a weekday, and at 11 o'clock on the Saturday night. You couldn't have much time to get up to shenanigans. But mind you, when I was at home in County Louth, you had to be in all the time. Your mother wanted to know where you were at every moment. Whereas now, at least I could be out till 11 o'clock on a Saturday night yeah. and I hadn't to account to anybody. And we had bicycles. There were three of us in the hall that did, that did science out in, out in UCD. But when I came out here to enrol, I didn't know soul. Because there was only three girls in our class went to college. With 40 of us in Dundalk did our leaving cert. Three of them went to university. And the other two did arts. They didn't do science. Right. So and was that anything. a good thing for you, that you didn't know anybody when you came, do you think? Well, most people didn't know anybody. I mm. mean, a lot of the people that were doing science were scholarship people. So they, they, they were the ones who got the, the places I discovered <laughs> afterwards. Did you find out who they oh, were? Oh, you know, yeah, but I, maybe, I better not mention it now at this point. And we all became, they did chemistry, they did physics, they did other subjects, you know. And they all had their county skulls. And, um, you know, that was so, that's, I mean, so they were all maybe one or two up from their own places that maybe, I mean, it would be very rare that schools would have two or three people with scholarships. Yeah. Although, that, that, that said, there was a contingent from Clonmel of whom two of them were, were in the same class and knew each other in school. Right. And but you, it sounds to me like you were so busy with all those practicals and all your study, you didn't really have time to do anything much beyond that, did you? Did you have to have part-time jobs or jobs in the summer and stuff? Or we were you expected, summer, I mean, where did you, the money for your living expenses, was that all included in the £350 for well, the year? That came out. It was 55 45 and 65 for the fees in, in Loretto Hall for the three terms. That was what you paid, and ninety pounds for for your for your um, college fees because science had gone yeah. up to ninety pounds in, in the, so in this the whole, ten years since yeah. Tony's time. Yeah. The, so the whole thing of having a part time job to sustain you during the time it wouldn't no, have been a runner. Yeah, no, you couldn't be doing that at all. That would be dreadful. Yeah. But I mean, so that you 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 came up here and you were out in Belfield. You had your lectures in the morning. You had and you had your study. You had your practicals in the afternoons. And then you know the library was out here. We had Miss Glynn, who was in charge of the library. We were all terrified of her. She she um. If you couldn't open your mouth in the library. In fact, the, it was the first year, 1967, that women were allowed to wear trousers in the library. Before that, you couldn't wear trousers in the library. That wasn't considered to be proper dress. And when we went to lectures, when Tony was talking about having, having to get your sit in front of your seat. Now, we weren't carry, that carry on that he's referring to, the nuns and then the women and the men. We were in alphabetic order. Oh. So, like, I was sitting beside fellas that I'd never met before and they'd never met me. And she was a great oh, social exciting. thing. Oh, it was very good indeed, yeah. And they <laughs> sat in front of your number and Tony, Tony was the, Tony was, not Tony, not, not Charles. you. No, no, neither of those. No, he was the technician. And he used to come out and write down the, anything he could see. And, of course, people who at the back who couldn't see the board were applying to be up the front because they couldn't hear or they couldn't see. And then your man was coming out and we had this list of all these people who wanted to move and he was real doubling with He was saying, this, this lecture should take place in the Eye and Ear Hospital. <laughs> Everything was, everybody was so, was so disabled not being able to see or hear that this was the story. But then you got your places then, you see, and similarly with practicals. So that's, you, you always worked with the same people. So that got you, that got you to know people quite yeah. quickly. And did you make yeah. any long lasting friendships or even relationships out of your time? Well, I was speaking of these fellas from Clonmel. Well, I married one of them. Oh, I did you? The I started going out with him in second year. Well, I didn't start going out with him in second year. That would be a lie. I met him in second year. Yeah. I met him on my 18th birthday. Oh in second my year, goodness. We, were, we were on a bus going to climb mountains in, in Enniscary or in Wicklow. And um, yeah, I got, I got married to him probably well, a long time later. And we're still married, actually. So fantastic. there you go. So fantastic. shout out to John Harding, who's put up with me all these years. <laughs> <laughs> and if you met him on a bus going to Enniscary, presumably you were doing a, a, a bit of external stuff as well. Oh yeah, you see, the, the, you, joined, you joined the Biological Society, that's what we had out here, and that was fine. This whole L&H stuff for us, we were far too, far too scientific and serious for that. But I also joined, I also joined the Legion of Mary. 
to yeah, choose. And it wasn't for any holiness, indeed. It was a way of meeting people. And mm. um, the Legion of Mary, we had a science branch of it, so that was out here in... in, in there was a chaplaincy arrangement, and it was, we all had yeah. chaplains for different... Oh, each of them, we had a science chaplain. There was a science, was a chaplain for all the other things. But not that we were holy in the least, but that was a way of meeting people as well. And there was a huge amount of social stuff associated with the Legion. So was we there? were the science branch of the Legion. There was Legion in Terrace, there was Legion in other places. And then there was trips organised by some of the... Not our, not our section, we didn't organise them, but you need to go climbing mountains to go for walks, to have hoolies and kaylies and singing and dancing. So there was a huge social scene associated. And there is a thing that. I never knew at all. It was great. That there right? was a, a yeah. social life attached to the Legion of And Mary. my Legion work mm. then, I mean, you, Tony was talking about going to going to Ranel and meeting poor people. My my work for the Legion was was minding a fellow in Balls Bridge who had seemed to have gone blind in old age, probably from, from um, diabetes or something, mm. I don't know, and he was being minded by his daughter. And so the daughter in order to get out once a week, wanted somebody to come and sit with the blind father who was quite old and he and I used to be the one going every week and I'd bring a different Legion person each time and get him to tell us the stories. So he used to, I used to, he was part of the activity in 1916 and he had right. great tales to tell. So every week I'd get him to tell the same story to the new person I had with. And the only reason we all went there was of course because the lady when she was leaving left us out a beautiful tea. So we were always starving so it was all these lovely sandwiches and stuff. We never mentioned God. I don't know whether the man was a Catholic or a Protestant. We never asked them. We never did anything holy of any description. But it was great crack. It was great fun. That's wonderful. Did you say, um, Charles, that just uh, it's coming into my head now when Anna was talking about the library and uh, the women weren't allowed to wear trousers. Did you, did you say something about the about um, the Angelus in the library? Oh, yes, and at 12 o'clock, if it had rang, people got up and said the Angelus. In the library? Uh, the, yes, whole, the whole yes, of the library? Yeah, yeah, well, a few rebels wouldn't do it. My recollection was most got up, but some others say not most, uh, but half or something. They might be led by the nuns who were in the reading. And did they say it aloud or was it silently? No, my recollection was it was said silently. No, they didn't, but they said they... The bell uh, would ring and... Uh, yes, yeah. and that would be. But it, it was, of course, very Catholic, practically. Everyone there was Catholic. And Michael Tierney was very keen that it should be... Uh, he was very close to the Archbishop of yeah. McQuaid yeah. and yeah. that it should be uh, recognised as a Catholic university, which it hadn't been as such. You know, it was a strictly a non-sectarian one. But Michael Tierney was striving to have it recognised mm. as a Catholic And university. the first building they built in Belfield was the church, the Catholic church, before even the science block. The church really? was there first, still there, that, that long. Yeah. It, was, it was one of those modern churches, like in, in those 60s churches where the old yes. Gothic ones we all grew up with. But this was, this was the, the Belfield Church, and it was the very first building, and it's still here doing Going Strong. But wow. it was interesting that that was the very first thing they put on campus. Well, gentlemen and lady, I hate to tell you, but we, I think, according to my calculations, are nearly running out of time. Uh, but, but, but before I finish with the three of you, is there, is there anything you'd like to tell us that you didn't get a chance to, to tell us about that I forgot to ask you or that you'd like us to know about <laughs> well, um, before we finish? Tony, you had looked just, at something. Just one thing is, in Earthford Terrace on a Saturday, if you went in on a Saturday morning, the main hall of Earth of Terrace was black and white tiles. That's right. And the cleaning staff had to wash on every Saturday so many tiles. So you came in, say, at half two or three, and you'd find a clean section here because the lady here was in Ireland. She did her piece. And then over there, there was another section. And the other thing about that main hall, which I'm sure Charles would remember, were the, re the, uh, the, uh, the red seats yeah. where you could sit and friendships were made there. Oh, indeed, and lots of watching of people went oh, on God, yes. there as well. It was a great place to sit for the bit of action, wasn't it? Well, it was a place you sat on, a, again, talking about the Catholic thing, was uh, in those days, um, and I'll be very quick about this, there was a strict fast during Lent, and you could only get off the, fa the, the fast, the strict fasting, either in confession or by a certain cleric or a certain level of, of priest. And there was a Father Tui, who yeah. was my dean of residence, and you would see him walking across the main hall, start a Lent, and you'd go towards him, and he'd see you, and he'd put up his hand, you're exempt. <laughs> Why? Because there was a queue of people coming looking for exemptions. Oh, yeah, well, that was the handy way of getting off so you didn't have to fast during Lent. But you had to get permission. Oh, yeah. Them were the days. They sure were. 
Charles, is there anything? He was a great you... figure. Another great figure in the college was Paddy Q, the oh, the porter. Porter. He was yeah. a great figure in the in the in the college for many years. Yes, and he was quite a powerful man in his own way, wasn't he? Oh, he would have had his power, and he was an informant on things. Uh, would have had a line to the president. <laughs> <laughs> <And so on. laughs> okay, I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. Um, and as we come to the end of this conversation, sadly, I'd like to finish by getting uh, a final, on, on, from each of you, on, on reflection of all your time in UCD. Is there anything that you could say that would help inspire incoming students? So I think we'll all do a short little one of those. And uh, if it's okay, uh, I'll start and then let each of you follow. Anna, Charles and Tony. So, my own reflection is that some of the best fun I ever had in my life was during my student years in UCD. And none of my school classmates went on to study what I did and few of them came to university anyway. And, and that was good because it forced me to make new friends. And my main advice would be don't stick to the people that you came in with, but make the effort to get to know others. And don't stick to your academic course either, if you possibly can. I'd say read as widely as you can, join as many societies and groups as you can, and build the new independent you. The other thing I would say is watch out for those who are finding it hard, personally, socially, academically, whatever, and give them a helping hand. Anna. Yes, my, my, my advice, I suppose I have two pieces of advice really, and, and my first piece of advice is do what you want to do. I mean, I wanted to do science and they thought I was mad, why are you doing that? But I wanted to do it because I didn't even have honours maths in school because I was a girl and I wanted to give it a go. And then at the end of first year then I actually went on to do botany. And they thought that was mad. What, would you, well, what kind of a job would you get doing that? Would you, be, would you be in the Botanic Gardens or something? But if you do something that you actually want to do, and never mind for whether it's employable or you have the points that are going to waste or whatever, do what you actually want to do. And then you'll certainly find your way in life rather than doing something that's a good bet for getting a job or something that you absolutely hate. So pick what you want. And the second thing is don't be coming scuttling home or going back when the minute your lectures are over. Stay there and enjoy the whole social scene, looking at my own children's generation, because they went to UCD as well, they went to UCD as well, they actually, um, not my children particularly, but a lot, of their, a lot of their colleagues just went to their lectures and came home and didn't build up any kind of a rapport. So if you're in college, take with the social scene, you'll never meet so many people of your own age, your own ability, your own sense of fun. And when you get your job in the real world, it's such a big mixture. This is your chance. It's a great time of your life. So go for it. Pick what you like to do and have fun in social life as well. Charles, if I could ask you to give yours. Well, I echo both your excellent advice. It's so good. Um, it's, but they were very ha I counted some of the happiest days of my life. <clears throat> I think the crucial thing is to work reasonably hard at your course but not to neglect uh, having another life outside it. It's a social experience and you want to have balance in what you do. And Tony? Yeah, well, two things I, I'd like to recommend to people. First, a piece of advice I got was, before you go into a lecture, read the notes of the previous day so you could get a continuity between one and the other. Don't take each lecture as, as a separate thing. And the second piece of advice I got from one of my professors who said, always ask questions. Don't, real, you've got to realize there's, n there's no such a thing as a stupid question, but there can be stupid answers. <laughs> so ask questions. Thank you very much, Anna and Charles and Tony for those very useful pieces of advice. Now we have two recorded messages, one from Desmond Green, who was referred to earlier by Charles, from the class of 1961, and he would love to have joined us today, but wasn't able to make it due to other commitments. Des studied chemical engineering at UCD and went on to become a very successful businessman, educator and entrepreneur. 
if you want to ask me for my advice to the recent graduates or young students, I, my, my advice would be, be prepared to take risks. This is the time in your life you can do it uh, without very many repercussions. And you can, if you, if you make a bad decision, you can change it very quickly and, and alter course. Um, going back to process dynamics, there's a feedback loop there as you can get involved in very quickly and change. Make, make good friends. I think college is a great place for making friends, lifelong friends, and do spend time doing that. It's, it's, um, I hate to use the word investment, but it's, it's a nurturing thing to do for your well-being all your life, to have good friends. And UCD is a great place to be able to do that. Um, be flexible in what you do and have, make some sort of a plan. It doesn't mean you have to, um, uh, to meet all aspects of it. But if you make a plan, at least you begin to focus your mind on what the future um, situation is and also what you need to do yourself in order to make the future good for you and for the people you live with and for the people around you in your community. One thing that occurs to me is that on our 50th anniversary, I, I spoke and I stressed the importance of giving um, now that we had sort of gone out in life and we'd reap the rewards of our education at UCD, and I suggested a class gift. Now, I think this has grown into a tradition of class giving at milestone reunions, um, and that giving has helped an enormous number of students. It's made a difference to their lives. It's given them opportunities that we had that without that gift, they would not have. So I would certainly encourage my uh, class members of 1961 to be generous again uh, to, and to support uh, some of the students who are less well off than we are and who need uh, financial support. And if you can't give financial support, there are all sorts of other ways of supporting them. There are mentoring and programs and everything else like that. So there's, there's no need to uh, feel that you can't give because and giving has too often just been associated with money. There's many ways of giving that we can consider and many ways of helping these students. So I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. We also have a message from Francis Fitzgerald from the class of 1971. Francis worked as a social worker and family therapist before entering politics, where, among other things, she's been responsible for important legislation to protect women and children over her 20 years as a parliamentarian, including time as Thánaiste and now as MEP. And the advice I would give to students today is to really enjoy your time in UCD. When I look back, I mean, I just loved it. I enjoyed UCD so much. I think I came into my own, actually. I was a very shy uh, student. Uh, I went for student rep at one time I, in second year, I think, much to my surprise, actually. And I was quite anxious about it. But I loved my subjects. I never thought that when I was doing philosophy, economics, you know, my social work and sociology. I often remember the lectures, actually. I often think back to them. But I never thought that when I became, you know, Tanishta and uh, Minister for Justice, that actually some of what I'd learned in UCD and the seeds that were sown actually inspired my political career. But I never thought of going into politics when I was doing social science. I would say to students, you know, do what you enjoy, do the subjects that you like. If you're unhappy, shift subjects, move, but follow them. Don't worry about your future career. I never did. I assumed I'd be a social worker and I was a social worker for 20 years. But then with my interest in equality, I went into politics. So I think, you know, build up your knowledge, build up your experience. I had a great social life in UCD. Enjoy the social life. Um, I came into my own, I think, when I was in UCD and it offered me that. And I did get involved, although not very heavily, in various societies. So I played tennis. I did voluntary work in the legal, uh, free legal aid, which interestingly, I was involved in the legislation in that area when I was minister. Little did I think that I'd be thinking back to my time as a volunteer in UCD. Um, I used to attend the Literary and Historical Society, the LNH, and looked on in awe at these people who were speaking so fluently then, never thought I'd be like that or even, you know, approach uh, that kind of competence in public speaking. And yet it's something I've had to do in my career. So I would say to students, you know, uh, take all the opportunities that UCD offers you. Fantastic lecturers, 
you know, intellectual stimulation and a great social life. And, you know, go for it. Enjoy the experience because really it's, it's actually, I think, more formative than any of us realize when we get that unique opportunity to go to university. And those three years were a great foundation for me. And I say well done to UCD. And I hope the students today, uh, despite all of the difficulties with COVID and so on, that they enjoy it as much as I did. Thank you for those reflections. I'll hand you over now to Nicole Black, director of the UCD Foundation, to say some final words. So thank you all for joining us. And thanks also to our speakers for the wonderful trip down memory lane. Thank you for joining us this evening to celebrate the Golden and Diamond Jubilee reunion, albeit in this virtual format. I hope you enjoyed the virtual trip down memory lane. Our heartfelt thanks to our speakers and moderator this evening, Darren, Tony, Charles and Aina, as well as Des and Francis. Your generosity with your time is very much appreciated. On your graduation 50 or 60 years ago, putting on a cap and gown may have signalled the end of your student experience, but as was witnessed this evening, your link with UCD wasn't broken. As an alum of this great university, you are part of a unique worldwide community of nearly 300,000 leaders, creators, innovators and change makers living across 185 countries, bound together by a shared university connection. You, our alumni, are one of our university's greatest strengths, and it is largely because of you that the value of a UCD degree continues to be enhanced for the next generation of students. It is only through the support of our alumni and friends that UCD can provide a world-class student experience and properly prepare our students to take our place in today's global society. Thank you for the time, effort and resources you continue to put into our university and in particular for supporting the student experience through giving back philanthropically or giving of your time and skills. As many of you will know, UCD is committed to supporting our students who are struggling to afford the rising costs of third level education. We believe it is crucial that such students are supported through the solidarity of our UCD community and we are seeking your help in this effort. To mark the occasion of your Golden and Diamond Jubilee reunions, a class gift appeal has been established to support these disadvantaged students. Together with your classmates, you can ensure that the next generation of students can follow in your footsteps and achieve their dream of attending UCD. If you've not yet participated and would like to find out more, simply visit the UCD Foundation website or arrange a call or email alumni at ucd.ie. Thank you again to the contributors from the class of 1961 and 1971 and all of those who provided memories. A special mention to Brian McIver for the wonderful set of photos that he shared with us. You will find the recording of this event on the UCD Alumni YouTube channel. Feel free to share or rewatch. In the meantime, stay safe and keep well. <laughs>